Hi, folks. We're excited to bring you our interview today with writer Paul Griffin, author of When Friendship Followed Me Home, to be released on Tuesday, June 7th of 2016, a book aimed at young readers 10 years old and over. Now, even though the book is aimed at a young reader, the conversation we have with Paul really covers Paul's life. His New York stories tend to be a little bit more intense, so if there's a young listener in our audience, I'd highly recommend that a parent be around. Thanks, and on to the show. My name is Paul Griffin, and my favorite animal is a dog by the name of Ray Liotta. Ray is a pit bull. He looks tough, but I say he's my favorite animal because he is the Buddha dog. He just has a heart of gold. This is Paw Print, an animal rescue community, episode 43. I'm Harold Ree. I'm Nancy Ree. Today's guest is writer Paul Griffin. Paul is married to my dear friend Risa. Risa is a filmmaker. And we'll be featuring Risa on a future episode. Today we talk about Paul and his wonderful book featuring characters like Ben Coffin, Haley, also known as Rainbow Girl, and Ben's dog, Flip. If you want to learn more about Paul Griffin and see some great photos... Go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 43. That's the number 43. Well, I write kids' books, young adult novels and middle grade novels uh, out here in New York. I always have three or four dogs in the house. <laughs> they come to us in any number of ways. We have a pit right now. He's... His name is Ray Liotta. I've, I've, <laughs> I've named, I've named uh, we had Marty Scorsese, he died. I had uh, Al Pacino, also no longer with us. And, I'm seeing uh, a theme here. Yeah, it's Italian like Italian-American actors. It's all Goodfellas dogs, you know? <laughs> oh, Goodfellas, they're, they're, yes. They're all, they're all these like, like these tough guy. You know, Where, they, where's Robert De Niro? Bobby, Bobby De Niro, he passed on. Oh, Bobby on. De Niro, oh, okay, he passed on. He, he passed on. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the next guy I get is going to be Harvey Keitel. Harvey Keitel. Oh, not Joe Pesci? Did you ever have I got to get a Joe Pesci, too. I I, Joe I'm, Pesci. Wary, I'm wary of naming a dog Joe because it sounds like no. And I don't talk to my dogs a lot, right. so I use the word no. That's a really big word for me. Like, oh, that I works, see. That works very well. I so if you. I, you know, Joe, no, you know, it, it, they might associate something negative with the name Joe. So I, I don't, I never name any dogs with an O in it. You live in New York City. That's where uh, we all first met was in the New York City area. And we miss you guys. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I we mean, you know, you we want to see you out here in California sometime. <laughs> but um, can you maybe describe to people who aren't familiar with New York City the challenges of owning a dog? It goes both ways, right? Because you don't have yards in New York and the apartments are small, but you do have to get your dog out four times a day. So your dog walks a lot. Uh, and where we live, we live up in Washington Heights, a little bit north of the George Washington Bridge, by this park called Fort Tryon. And the the cloisters are there. It's this medieval museum that the Rockefellers had brought over from France piece by piece in the 1930s. So it's this beautiful park. And that's where I, I loop the dogs around the cloisters every morning. It's beautiful because there's so many other dogs out on the street. I'm generally careful with whom I let the, the dogs fraternize with. But I'm sure you have folks in San Francisco who are kind of mm -hmm. like, I, I see these, these 25 foot leashes, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people just kind of let them run out right. and you have like a, a dog running across the street and I'm wary of folks like that. I, but they do have dogs that they know and, and we all walk together and, and it, it's not uncommon for you to be walking with two or three folks, uh, you know, who have more than one dog and you can have a pack of like eight dogs walking. So that's kind of nice for the dogs. I don't generally let them into the uh, the dog run. There's a, a thing with pit bulls in New York now. One of my dogs, uh, Ray Liotta, he's a, he's a pit and he looks really tough. He is the absolute most gentle dog I've ever had. I have never had a problem with him, not with another dog, not with a human. He's just a big, beautiful baby. I find that when I, I take him into the run that people get scared. So I, I don't, I can't go to the dog run anymore with him. When did you start writing? How many books have you written? I saw the movie Rocky when I was 10 or 11 years old. I can't remember when it came out. I think it was 76. And the next day, I remember waking up and thinking, I want to do that. I want to tell stories like that for a living, hmm. underdog stories. 
stories about people that could be from my neighborhood. And I started I started writing little short stories. My friends were one of the first families to have a video camera, this big, huge VHS camera. They were just uh, coming out around then. And we used to shoot these little movies. And so that turned into I was the guy who wrote all the scripts. And the scripts got longer and the short stories got longer to the point where when I was in college, I was I was writing a couple of screenplays a year. I was working on a novel in college and I knew that that I had to try to do this for I, I wanted to do something with storytelling and see if I could make a living at it. And it took I graduated June 12th, 1988 from school and my first book came out June 12th, 2008. So it was 20 years mm. uh, of writing before I, I got that first book out there. So how many books have I written? Probably about 30. But I've had since 2008, uh, this one, When Friendship Followed Me Home, that'll be my my sixth uh, published book. And I have two more coming out next year. So it'll be uh, it'll be eight published and, you know, out of like 30 plus. Right. I think it's just a coincidence, but we actually have had several authors of various backgrounds on the show. And, you know, it ranges from one vet veterinarian. I believe she got her first book published the first try. More to the point of what you're saying, I think most authors would definitely agree with your assessment that, hey, you know, you just keep writing books and, and the hope is to get them all published, but it doesn't necessarily happen that way, right? That's it. I mean, you know, some, uh, my friend just won the Newbery Award, which is like the Academy Award of uh, Children's Literature. It's, his name is Matt De La Pena, and he's such a great guy. And he broke in in 2005, and 10 years later, it took him 10 years really to kind of, he, he's done well for since his first novel. He's such a hardworking guy. He's always on the road, doing tons of school visits, conferences. It's just so great to see him get that kind of recognition after putting in a whole decade, you know, of, yeah. of really just hard work. That's awesome. I think you have to have a thick skin, right? Well, all of us, right? It, it's, I, I think a lot about these dogs that we take in. I mean, you guys have rescued 53 now at this point. And Reese and I have been doing this for, since we've been married, so 19 years. And I, I think about these dogs, where they come from. Like the one guy I was telling you about, Ray Liotta, the pit. He's an 80-pound dog. He was full-grown when I got him from the shelter, and he was 24 pounds when I got him. He was just, he looked, he was just skin and bones. And they were going to put him down because he was sick, and he just gave me that look. You know, I was down there walking some of the dogs. I don't know. There was just something in his eyes, and there was like a hope there. You know, there was even after what he had been through and. I have to tell you this story about what he'd been through. I, he had kennel cough when I got him, as most uh, dogs do when you pull him out of the, the shelters here, particularly in the winter. I had to put him in isolation because I already had three dogs here. So I, I found this vet in Woodhaven, uh, which is where my family comes from. It's on the border of Brooklyn and Queens. And the guy was so great to me, uh, Woodhaven Veterinary Clinic. He, for eight bucks a day, he let Ray be there because it was going to be a three-week thing where he was in isolation. So it was a two-hour train ride each way for me to get down there. And that dog would just wait for me to get there just to spend a few hours with me. I got a lot of reading done <laughs> that month, you know, back and forth on the train. But he really hung in there. And as much as he started to gain weight while he was there for the three weeks, his cough never really went away so the vet said you know i think there's something else going on here i want to do an x-ray so we put him up on the table and the vet showed me the the picture and he had a notch in his uh throat in his windpipe the vet said yeah i, I kind of thought this is what it was what they do is to make the dogs fierce and strong their legs strong they hang them the the dog fighters hang the dog about an inch or two off the ground and leave the dog like that for hours. So the dog has to push up with its legs to be able to breathe because oh my clearly gosh. if it, yeah. So, I mean, he had that done to him and he still had that hope, you know, that's that belief that there was beauty at the other end of, you know, these bad days that he had. And, and I, I guess he's my little Buddha dog. 
and I, I think that as a writer you kind of have to have that too you know or, or any kind of artist you gotta things are tough you know it's tough writing a book but it's tougher to get one out there you know it, it's hard even when you have an amazing publisher uh my my publisher is penguin and i also work with scholastic and they're two of the best and they work so hard to get the book out there but still it 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 takes almost like a miracle for for the book to uh to find a home you know they say for a book to find its audience you know that's the expression that they use it's it's tricky you know a lot of things have to line up and and you have to have hope to stay in this business so well i, I love the fact that you use the analogy of of a pit bull's life with the writer's life right i mean there there are some similarities <laughs> right <laughs> you, you gotta have that that tenacity i guess they say pits you know there's a myth about pits that their jaws lock that that's not true but they are tenacious they're tenacious in their friendship i've never uh, i mean look all my dogs are amazingly loyal but this guy ray he's just uh he's something else and when he really digs into a friendship or a person he's just there and he hangs on and i i think for a writer you you do have to have that you you have to have that thing of like well maybe the next one or you know this one was was good but <laughs> i gotta keep hanging in there to make the next one you know uh, go okay so yeah. yeah it's tenacity how has this whole life of rescuing dogs and volunteering and all that in what ways has it changed you i think it's made me i hope it's made me a more patient person more compassionate the beauty of being with dogs and i've had them all my life my grandfather this is before we knew backyard breeding was a bad thing. Back in the uh, 50s and 60s, my grandfather was a firefighter, and he had five kids. My grandmother's mother and her two sisters living with him. I mean, the guy was just, uh, he had the, uh, the biggest heart in the world. He took, he took the whole family in. But, you know, try being nine people living on a firefighter's salary. So he bred these German shepherds. His father had to, uh, had raised shepherds, and he trained them. And he taught me how to work with dogs from a young age, like never to be afraid of a dog, never raise your voice to a dog. You never hit a dog. You just have to have this quiet strength in you when you're working with the power breeds like the shepherds or the Rottweilers, the boxers, the pits. I mean, these are these dogs are so big hearted, but they do thrive when you provide an environment of discipline. I find that having to be a leader like that with the dogs to just be that that gentle, uh, quiet, gentle, but strong leadership that has made me spilled over into other areas of my life. I wouldn't describe myself as the most confident person, but being with dogs, I'm, I'm very confident with dogs because I've worked with so many dogs over the years. And I find that a little bit of that does carry over in my, you know, my non-dog <laughs> relationships. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's made me, it's made me more confident. It's made me more patient. It's made me more uh, compassionate. It's a constant reminder to try to hit the mark with those three areas of my life just because I'm, you know, I'm surrounded by dogs all the time. It's rare that I'm not with a dog. Thanks for sharing that. This conversation is such a gift. I haven't had a real conversation with anybody in such a long time because Reese has been traveling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to you, there seems to be a running theme of the grittiness of life or, you know, survival instincts. What made you the person you are today that you um, ha have this compassion and empathy for animals or people down on their luck? Where did that come from? Well, I think that I started working when I was really young. My, my father was an English teacher. English teachers back in the uh, 60s and 70s, you know, it was, it was tough living on an English teacher's salary. Yeah. Uh, so he used to work, you know, every English teacher had two jobs. My father, when the weather was bad, would wait tables. During the summers and in the spring and into the fall, he would do construction. So I would go with him uh, and help him do whether it was, you know, a fix-up job or uh, he got into building uh, porches and decks for a while. He taught me how to how to work and save money from a really young age. And as soon as I could, I bought out a paper route from this kid in the neighborhood. Yeah, it's no, like I, mergers and acquisition. <laughs> I bought this guy. I think I paid two hundred dollars for the wow. route. And he, and he thought he, you know, he took me off like you know he he was getting away 
good there, but I was able to grow that route. And this is when I was eight years old. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I did that and I grew that route and I got my sister in on it. At one point we had 180 newspapers, which is, which is a pretty big route to do for a daily route. That's a huge route. And yeah. And just learning how to save and seeing money come in was amazing. But that job was phenomenal because you had to deliver the papers, but half the job and the harder part of the job was you had to collect the money. Sure. And I met so many different folks and you'd meet a lot of folks who were down in their luck who couldn't afford the paper. Some people would come to the door drunk and it would be, you know, 10 in the morning on a, a Saturday, you know, you got to know like what families were having troubles or whose dad was not around. And you can't help but, but really root for people when you see that they're having a hard time. And I think that that paper route was such an education for me. The, the jobs that I ended up being in, I was always with folks who were struggling. A lot of that, you remember, you don't remember so much the hard times that people are having or, or the time that you're having a hard time. You remember the, the fact that they keep trying. Hmm. And I was around that so much uh, in my life that people just kept trying and that became for me the most inspiring thing to write about like I, I I never sit down and say oh you know what I'm gonna write a story about this theme you know it's just that these characters start talking in your head mm. and there's always a dog in it because there's always a dog in my life and these things generally come together and, and I guess what I'm interested in is reminding myself that even when life is really hard that we keep trying that resilience i think resilience is just it's such a beautiful quality and it yeah it never gets old thinking about it or seeing it or uh you know falling into a story we're speaking to paul griffin author of when friendship followed me home check it out at your local bookstore tell us a little bit about the uh the three main characters two of them human one of them not human this book is a uh, it's for middle grade on up. And should I tell you about the inspiration for this story? Yes. There's a, a rescue, an animal rescue down on 110th Street on the uh, east side of Manhattan. And uh, I was going down there a lot when uh, my wife and I were living in Astoria in Queens. I was, I'd head on over there and I'd, I'd, I'd like to visit the dogs. Um, and one day I went in, I had settled on a dog that I was gonna take home. And as I was waiting for the paperwork to go through, a woman came in and she looked like she was having a hard time. And she had a cat with her in this kind of shabby cat box. And she was a wreck. And the cat looked listless in the, in the box. She said to the person at the counter, uh, you know, I'm gonna surrender this cat. And the person behind the counter said, well, it's a $75 surrender fee. And she said, oh, no, it's not my cat. I found it. I'm just, you know, trying to, to get the cat off the street. The woman behind the counter nodded and, and took the cat in. And the, the woman who was handing over the cat just burst into tears and, and ran out. So I, I went outside to see if she was okay. And I got the story. And the story was that she had become homeless. She couldn't take care of the cat on the street. And the cat was old, and she just wanted it to have, at this point, a peaceful death. And she didn't have the 75 bucks to surrender the cat. And I think what really killed her was she had to renounce her relationship with the cat. They had been together for so long. I don't know, like, I never forgot that story. Not only are you losing your home, but you're losing your family. You know, because of your housing situation, you can't be together anymore with with your best friend. That really just, I don't know, it, it struck me. And that was the inspiration for this story. It's, it's about this kid, Ben Coffin. He was in foster care. Uh, I work with for the last, uh, since I graduated college, so I guess 20, 26 years, 27 years I've been working with uh, kids who are at risk of falling through the cracks here in New York. And uh, there were a couple of kids that I met who were, again, really resilient, you know. And so those kids uh, inspired this character, Ben Coffin. And Ben has been in foster care 
for 10 years. It's really hard to get adopted anyway out of foster care, but the older you get, the the lower your chances right. get. Ben thought he would just kind of end up going through foster care until he became an emancipated minor and then be out on his own. Um, but this angel, who's a speech therapist working at the foster home, adopts him. And things are good for a couple of years. And then she dies. She, she was an elderly, she was older when she adopted him, his mom. Uh, she was 67 and had a heart attack and died. So Ben went to go live with the woman's sister, Zan. And things weren't really working out in that living situation. The, the uncle is not, it's not that he's a bad guy. He's just not a guy who's ready to be around kids, like have a kid living in the home. Right. And his character's that, name is Leo, correct? Leo the lion. And uh, Leo's got a lion heart, but he's also, he can be ferocious like a lion too. So that, that situation doesn't really work out. And uh, Ben, in the meantime, has befriended this dog. There was this little dog that uh, was out on the street and Ben took him in uh, back when uh, he was living with his mom there in that nice two-year uh, window. He takes his dog in. The dog just thrives with Ben. They become best friends. The uh, dog's name is Flip. And then the young woman in the book, her name is, is uh, Haley, and she is what you would call a library kid. She loves reading and she loves writing, and her mom is a librarian. So after school, Haley's already always in the library, and Ben – Ben's a library kid too, and and they strike up this friendship that just they they really they really kind of uh, complete each other in the sense that I think they're both looking to tell a story, and they come together to write what they think is a a sci-fi novel, and what it ends up being is more of a mystery, and that mystery is why can't friendship last forever? Uh, Halley's dealing with. She's in recovery from um, this horrible form of cancer called rhabdomyosarcoma. And uh, my perspective on cancer has, has always, I was interested in writing about from the perspective of the person who's left behind. I lost uh, a best friend to cancer uh, in fifth grade. My grandmother died of it in sixth. And then just from then on, I just lost a lot of people, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Um, age-related cancers, lost a lot of friends. And it's, it's always been this idea of, wow, these, these people, like they were so important to me and now they're not there anymore. And how do I not lose them? I just, I find that I have to make time to remember them. And whether that's by, you know, looking at pictures or literally just sitting back and closing my eyes and trying to remember a great time that I had with this person. Um, and I think that's what, what Ben and Hallie are trying to figure out as they, as they write this story. Like, how, do they, how, does, how is this friendship that's so important to both of them, how do we make that last, like, beyond death? You tend to focus more on a young adult slash children's audience. What do you enjoy about it? What are some of the challenges? It's one and the same. The the joy and the challenge is, is the, the main one, is that you get to go back to being 13. And I just remember that as being such an amazing time when things are still so brand new. And every day there's the promise of some new joy or and, or horror. Things just hit you so hard when you're when you're that age and you're so impressionable, you know, your brain isn't even, isn't really wired. And, uh, I lean hard on my nieces for that. My sister has three girls. They're 17, 16, and 14 now. They're really helpful on, on, on giving me that perspective of what it's like to be uh, a teen. Although they're a little bit too cool at this point to really talk about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But a few years ago, it was just a joy to hear them talk about their day and, you know, the dramas of the day and the things that made them happy. And it's such a gift to be able to to be able to explore life that way. Being a writer, you can you can be so many different things and be so many different people. And I, I think that that's been the the real gift. And, and 
to get back to the the question, like why write about uh, teens and uh, you know kids who are who are getting into their teens? I I, I feel like that I, the bravest folks that I meet are generally of that age. The way they they navigate this world with not having i mean they don't have the authority yet they don't have the age the authority that comes with age or they don't have the the schooling yet uh the the intellect yet to be able to handle so many of these situations that kids today are having to deal with just mm. the world moves so much faster than when i was a kid and um to to be around kids who were who are navigating a, a world that moves so fast and just to see them do it with grace is it's a gift yeah mm -hmm. courage tends to be a pretty strong theme in the book what are the themes for like a prospective reader or a prospective parent who wants to take a look at your book what what are the themes do you focus on in the work it's interesting that my original title was Travelers and Magicians, and that was I, I had thought about the idea that you know we're all travelers together, right? We're all trying to figure out this life together, and you come across these people who are they're just able to kind of bring gold into life. They just have this this other centeredness and this you know ability to to bring happiness into other people's lives, right. and so those are the magicians of life. But that my publisher thought that that title sounded a bit like a fantasy novel and and absolutely I, I agreed and and they said you know why don't we do something that's like a little bit simpler and more about realistic fiction i guess that would be the category for this book so why don't right. we go for something like that so they came up with the title when friendship followed me home mm -hmm. so i think in terms of, of themes they nailed it the theme of the book what the book is about in its heart and that it's about friendship and the different forms that it takes and the, the lengths of friendship. Some friendships are intense, but brief and, and some are meant to go on for a long time. And so I think that's what I ended up writing about. And I didn't even know it was just the, the, the different kinds of friendship that are out there and how they're all really beautiful because they're they're all the thing that's beautiful about them these different kinds of friendship is that it's all about your your giving this book took a while to write this one we started uh, my editor and I started on it about 4 years ago hmm. and i guess in the in the writing of it it was it was a pretty intense 3 years in the writing and editing my editor is amazing she just you know when somebody adopts your characters and takes them in as, and shows them as much love as as you know she might show her own kids i mean that's just it's so so inspiring and and such a gift and it makes you want to keep trying to make the book uh you know see what the book can be and watch it change and and i i think my editor kate uh harrison at dial books for young readers she's just she really took this book into her heart and so much of her heart is in this book and i think that my relationship with kate my friendship with her is one of the formative uh relationships in my life and i hope that that came out in the in the book that what? that intense friendship yeah wonderful can you talk a little bit about the new york setting it's a very particular setting that people might be familiar with sure most of the book is set in coney island that place for me ever since i was a little kid that place has always been magical for me. I feel like people go to Coney Island to to celebrate, right? It's either you're going for a day at the beach or there are all these places to eat on the boardwalk. And it, it's so much about going there to have a good time. But the the actual neighborhood of Coney Island is one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City. I feel like you see people who are really having a hard time walking amongst people who are really having a great time. I think you do a wonderful job. The whole balance of in a kid's imagination or in a kid's mind, Coney Island can really spark the imagination of a Ben Coffin or a Haley, 
But then you balance that with the fact that, yeah, it's a rough neighborhood. It's school is tough. There's, there's a lot of rough kids around who don't necessarily have your, your best interests, right? So I think you do that a wonderful balance of how Ben and Haley, to a certain degree, have to struggle with that. Oh, thanks, Harold. Risa, my wife, told me, she said, you know, this character that you, that you wrote, Ben Coffin, he, I mean, he's you. Huh. And I said, well, why do you say that? And she <laughs> said, just, just look from the name. Ben Coffin, Paul Griffin. I mean, they, they almost they almost sound the same. And I, I think probably this kid, <laughs> I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, for better and worse, I guess he's he's the, I guess he's the closest I've ever wrote about in terms of the kid I was. The budding childhood romance of Ben and Haley. How did you envision it and how did it end up turning out? Well, I, I remember, you know, being that age that just being completely girl crazy. I was never one of those boys who was like, ugh, girls, you know, it, it was, I always thought that their energy was just awesome. They were just great to be around, great to be uh, friends with. I, I remember that idea of first love was you never really forget that. It's reflected in in the loves that you have after it, I think. Just that, that in the intensity of feeling that way about another person for the first time. I've known my wife now for 30 years, and we've been together for 22, married for 19. And I feel like the relationship in the book, it was a combination of my sister's friend who lived across the street. She she was a really cool girl, kind of kind of sad. And she was a really good friend of my sister. And I think I was 13. And I remember, like, we were just hanging out. Lisa just held my hand. And that was, I just, like, sparks went off when that, when that happened. It's because I just thought she was such a cool person. And just holding hands that way was just, I'll never forget that. Sure. It wasn't until Risa and I got together that that intensity was it was like that every day for such a long time and you know it never it never ends Reese and I were talking about it um, we we went to Rome last summer to celebrate our 20th early sure Reese had a whole bunch of miles and she really she was going to go work in Rome so she flew me over there with her and, and we had these four days in Rome and it was like the honeymoon all over again and she said oh you know it, it it's I, can't, I don't want this to end and I said you know the thing is though it really doesn't like when we're together it doesn't end like that it's the friendship has become so much more intense over the years like I uh, of course, I would die for Risa, but more than that, I live for her, right? Like I really – so much of what I do in my day is with her in my mind. I dedicated this one, this When Friendship Followed Me Home because it was so much about friendship. I, I dedicated it to her and I feel like that romance becomes this thing that, that's, that's stronger than that, this friendship that – Really, you can. I, I don't know if you can know it more than once in a life, or if you'd want to know it more than once in a life. Like an intense friendship like that, where you're also romantically involved with the person. It's 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 awesome. The release of the book in June of 2016 is it determined by you or or by the publisher? The publisher plans out when the release is going to be after they buy the book. Mm -hmm. There can be anywhere from like with this book, it'll be four years from the time that it was bought to the time it's released. It can be, could be that the publisher thinks that it's a summer read. I've been very lucky with library, school and library sales. Sure. Uh, that's, that's where most of my books uh, end up going. And I, I think that it, it's they release books like mine in May, June, because it gives the book a couple of months to be out there before the school year starts up and and when librarians are going to start bringing the the book into the school library. It just gives a couple of months for the book to get out there a little bit and word to get out there about the book and reviews. You know, if you get a few good reviews, that 
the librarians definitely read the trade magazines to see, you know, what the critics are saying. And the critics in children's books are awesome. They they not only look at the book in terms of uh, what it is as, as a piece of art or a story, they also – uh, judge it in, in terms of how it's going to be appropriate for a certain age group. And, you know, if you have a more challenging book, like a grittier book, they will bring that out and they'll, and they'll help librarians, you know, who are looking for that kind of book. They'll, they'll say, Hey, if, if you, if you need something like this, if you're looking for a harder edge story, you know, it, and, and they might give comps like it, it, you know, it'll appeal to this book will appeal to fans of so-and-so's books, you know? So they, they really try to help find the book a home. Sometimes you get whacked. I've always found that the, even the, the reviews that, I don't look at them as negative, but the the ones that are where they didn't like the book, the the reasons why they don't like it, I can see where they're coming from, and it definitely helps me for the next one. How do folks find Paul Griffin? How do folks find your books? They can go to paulgriffinstories.com. I have a Facebook page. I use it as a way for people to message me. Mm. It's just easier for them. And if you go to the website, paulgriffinstories.com, there's a contact tab, click here, and that'll take you to the Facebook page where you can message me. I just think it's so awesome what you're doing, like not just rescuing the dogs, but talking about it. I listen to podcasts when I walk my dogs, and I, I, I have to be walking my dogs about 90 minutes a day. So, I, I mean, I feel like if if people can download the podcast while they're walking the dogs, it's just you're really going to be – you're going to be catching them at just the right time and that they'll be able to – spread the word of the good work, the beautiful work that you and Nancy are doing. I think every dog that's rescued inspires another rescue. So just, just getting the word out there about the, about the dogs and, and rescuing the dogs is such a beautiful thing. And I'm so grateful to both of you for doing it. We want to say thank you to Paul Griffin for sharing his stories and for writing a wonderful book in When Friendship Followed Me Home. Look for it at your local bookstore starting on Tuesday, June 7th. If you want to learn more about Paul Griffin, go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 43. If you'd like to nominate someone to be a future guest on Pawprint, you can send us an email at thisispawprint at gmail.com or go to our contact page, thisispawprint.com slash contact. Don't forget that Irit Bloom, our favorite positive reinforcement dog trainer, is sharing with us two free resources called Check It Out. You can find it by going to our website, thisispawprint.com slash ask and simply sign up. If you want to find me or Nancy on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, look for This Is Paw Print, all one word. If you want to listen to more episodes of Paw Print, you can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, and as of last week, YouTube. You can find us there at thisispawprint.com slash YouTube, and it'll bring you straight to our channel, which features all the paw print episodes. We want to thank you, our listeners out there, for sharing your stories and for sharing paw print with your friends and family. Remember that you share a positive message of love and peace by saving an animal. Have a great day, everyone, and see you next time on Paw Print. Paw Print is a production of E-V-E-R Education. You can handle the truth. Woohoo!